Hello everybody, this is Roberto Capodesi. We are here again for another amazing interview. Let me give a little bit of backstory on this one, yeah? Because this goes back to the time when I was a kid, you know, as a teenager, when I was living in Italy, I was fascinating with the art of hacking the phone network. And the god in this field was, and I dare to say, still is, uh, John T. Draper, also known as Captain Crunch. He realized at the time that the whistle given uh, as a surprise in the famous serial would generate a ton of 2600 Hz that was used in the long distance phone networks. In short, whistling on the phone gave a free long distance call access. This is what gave him the nickname of Captain Crunch. And Draper, who had worked with the computer legend like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Um, Captain Crunch, I hired him briefly. I thought that I thought that you know one of the things that computers should do is attach to phone lines. Well, Captain Crunch had this better idea. He said, "Well, gosh, I could program this machine to dial all these 800 numbers into companies that have watts extenders, dial 76 numbers on beep 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 beep, and I can make free calls." Was, you know, so he, he had he had this board that he developed. Used a little phase lock loop that could both generate touch tones and listen for tones on the line, and you could program it in BASIC. But everyone else at Apple didn't like Crunch. Only me. Then Steve Wozniak brought the discovery to the next level, invented a device that could inject various tones into phone calls to gain control of phone system. He called this device the blue box. There was also the black box, red box, white box, and so on. But the blue box became the most famous. So Trapper was my hero, a true master of the art of phone hacking, and I can't believe how lucky I am to have the chance to interview him today. As I prepared for the interview, I couldn't help but reflect on my own experience with the uh, phone freaking and the uh, blue box. As a teenager, I built this device uh, to make to make free calls, but also to explore the world of phone networks. The deal was simple. In the night, we would go in a dark area, get into the phone booth, uh, use a phone coupler to connect the laptop uh, to the headset of the public phone, and call the phone operator to, through a toll-free number, and gain access to a dial tone. Then we use this dial tone to dial up into bulletin board systems or other places that I cannot share right now. I want to hear Drapper's own stories and anecdotes about his time as a phone uh, hacker and his experiences with other hackers and thinkers. And we are not using the word hacker as a, you know, crypto criminal or, a, you know, internet criminal. Hacker were a group of people that would do research, who find the particular functionalities that nobody else can access, okay? I'm still eager to learn from a true master of the art of hacking and to hear his thoughts on the past, present, and future of computer security and the world of hacking. John, what inspired you to create the Blue Box and other tools and how did you go about designing and building them? Well, what inspired me was the fact that you could do it. That's what inspired me. In other words, I was, I, I, I couldn't believe it was that easy to get into the phone system and make free calls. It didn't really, it didn't really uh, uh, connect with me until I actually tried it. So once the frequencies were given to me and the procedures, and the procedure was very simple. You call an 800 number, you send the 2600 down the line before the operator answered. You get the kajig sound. And with a blue box, you had to key pulse, area code number start, and the call would go through to whatever you wanted to call. And once I, I, I visited Denny, well, a, a phone freak friend of mine, he basically called me at random. And uh, I asked him, he asked me to come over to visit him. I came over and visited him. He had a friend over there with an organ. And he used an organ to make free calls. <laughs> And so I, uh, I couldn't believe it. So I, I, went, I dashed home as fast as I could. I had a bunch of electronic parts and I, see, I'm an, I was an electrical engineer, so I knew how to build circuits and design circuits. So I built, I built the oscillator for 700, the 900, 1100, 1500, and 1700. I had a button for each one. And I had to press two buttons to make the tones, and I had to know which to press. Later on, later on, I had I had a button for each number, but I didn't at the very beginning. So I pressed two buttons this way, two buttons this way, two buttons this way. 
you know, until until the call went through. And I couldn't believe it. It worked. I out. My parents must have thought I was going stark raving mad when I was just hooping and hollering around the house. And I said, that couldn't be that easy. So I tried a bunch of other numbers and I waited to see if, and then I waited to see if they showed up on my bill and they didn't show up on my bill. So I knew that they were free. And that's what inspired, that's what inspired me. And then I, and then I, and then I stopped doing it from home because then he started to tell all of his high school friends about this guy who builds his electronic device to make free calls. And he starts to brag it at his high school. And then that's when and then this guy, George Alex, chief special agent of the phone company, then busted Denny. I stopped doing it at that point. I just laid low. I didn't do anything. Later on, I, I later on I social engineered the operator. I said, operator, I gotta make a data call. You're gonna get false supervision, which meant that you're gonna get flashing on our on our board. He said, just just ignore the false supervision. And more than likely, she just ignore it. And as I was able to make calls that way from pay phones. How did your work with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak influence your hacking and technological pursuit? Well, I met Steve. Uh, I met Steve Woz first of all. He read the Esquire article, and the Esquire article was about the secrets of the blue box. I was being interviewed on a local radio station, and I demonstrated the blue box at the local radio station. And Steve Wozniak heard that broadcast. He says, "Quick, Steve!" And he, called, he was calling Steve Jobs. I was like, "Listen to this guy!" And then, and then they saw the. Uh, the Esquire magazine article on his coffee table about the secrets of the Blue Ox and Captain Crunch. So he knew that the frequencies were not correct. So what he did was he went down to the Stanford Research Institute and they had a copy of the uh, Bell System Technical Journal. And in there were the frequencies of the little blue box. So Steve built the blue box using those frequencies, but he didn't know how to use them. He didn't know the he had to blow 2600 to clear the line and all that stuff. He didn't know that. Once he once he heard that our, that interview, one of his friends who knew me contacted me and said, "You want to meet this guy, Steve Wozniak? He built this, this digital blue box." I said, "Sure." I went down to his dorm at UC Berkeley, and Bill Claxton, uh, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, and one other guy, the four people in the dorm, and I showed Steve how to do it. And looked at his blue box and said, that's not going to work because they were square waves. And he tried to send square waves down the phone line. It's analog. You're going to drop all kinds of trouble cards. But we were eventually able to get it to work by trying and trying and trying over and over and over again. We'd have to try about 10 times, but eventually on the 10th time, it would work. We want, I said, who do you want to call? And Steve says, let's call the Pope. Okay, sure. Let's call the Pope. So I called the inward operator. What's Italy's country code? 39, yes. Yeah, I got, I'll keep all 039. One three one, and that's information operator in Italy. So I asked the operator, I said, "What's the number to the uh, to the Vatican?" And she gave me the number to the Vatican. And this was about seven o'clock West Coast time. Now, seven o'clock West Coast time is about four in the morning Italy time. So I said, Are "You sure you're gonna want to call the Pope?" But it's you know, it's like you know, it's like four in the morning. He says, "Yeah, I want to call the Pope." I said, "Okay, I want to confess." All right, Steve, I'll call the book for you. What was your most memorable experience and what did you learn from it? Good question. I guess my most memorable experience was the discovery of the blue box, the discovery that it worked. That was pretty much because once I got into the network, it was like one discovery after another discovery. I discovered all kinds of really interesting stuff. Your opinion? How has the art of hacking and computer security evolved since the days of the blue box? Once that uh, once that Esquire article came out, that pretty much police, telephone security people, and everybody very concerned that toll plaza was going to go up. And so the phone company did some very very serious activities. To stop it! They basically programmed their uh, computers to look for excessive 800 numbers and if they made too many 800 numbers and if the 800 numbers went to numbers that were not supposed to have 800 have long calls, then they would bust you that way. And all they would do is just put a dial number recorder on your line. But what I did to get around the, get around the uh, 
loans. If you send 2600 down the line, then then they're going to detect you because then they got a 2600 detector on your line. So for the most part, what I did was I would not use 2600 because there were other ways to get into the trunk other than using 2600. There was no uh, correlation between like a normal call and me. You know, it was the same. How do you feel about the legacy of the blue box and its impact on the history of computing and telecommunication? And what advice would you give to aspiring good hackers and thinkers today? The blue box basically put the phone company in the hands of individuals who are not concerned with the cost of making calls and communicating. The fact that you could communicate anywhere in the world for free, which you could do right now, now. I mean, look at, look at what we're doing now. We're communicating, right? And I also would like to hear your take on the cultural significance of the Fona freaking subculture and its influence on modern day hacking and cybersecurity. Eventually, uh, the blue box was slowly being shut down. All the switches were slowly closing down. There were, there were less and less places where you, you could get access to the blue box and those choke points were monitored very heavily. So it pretty much ended the blue box calls. And now we went from blue boxes to the present. Okay. Right. What happened was the DCA's modem came out in about 1979. DCA's modem came out in 1979. And you could then dial into other computers. And then BBSs came out. Okay. And one of the BBSs that you had was, uh, I forget the name of it. But it was a really popular BBS. Anyway, so he, he set up uh, a, a BBS system, which was really popular here in the States. You're uh, talking about for, Fidonet. Uh... Yeah, that's it. Fidonet. That, that's the one. That's Fidonet. Fidonet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they had what is called uh, UUCP, Unix, Unix copy program. And, and then they came out with this thing called uh, Usenet. I posted the, in the comp.miss, the most read Usenet channel, comp.miss. And I posted an article called The Hacker's Eye View to the Soviet Union. Right. I just came back from Russia. That got more than 40,000 views. I got swamped. And then, of course, I got a visit by the FBI. The next day, <laughs> I wanted to know what I was doing in Russia. There was this opportunity to go to Russia with projects for planetary peace. Citizens from America, various different skill sets. And then they hooked up the citizens from Russia with the same skill set. So a plumber from the U.S. and me, a plumber from Russia. I, as a programmer, met a programmer from Russia. And guess which programmer I met? I met, I met Alexei Pajanov, the guy that wrote Tetris. And then when I was there at the university, uh, in fact, I'm going to be putting a, I'm going to be putting a YouTube channel where I interviewed Arkady Bukowski on, on my YouTube channel. Basically be posting to Patreon first. So since you're a member of my Patreon, yes, I right. put his interview up probably in the next week or so. It's been an incredible pleasure to have this chat with you, John, and uh, look forward to have more uh, chat with you in the future. And uh, for everybody, if you have a particular question you want to ask uh, to Captain Crunch, please uh, let me know and we'll make sure that we're going to ask uh, John his opinion and his ideas on things. Thank you again uh, for being here today and uh, see you at the next uh, episode. Hey, wait a second. You saw John, he's not young anymore. And uh, having lived this life as an anchor for the community, he's now a little bit in trouble. So. He has a GoFundMe campaign, you're going to find the link down and uh, you can also subscribe to his Patreon and uh, give him a help uh, to make true and uh, buy his medicine that he needs and, uh, you know, support him for all he did in the past for all of us. So if you ever enjoyed uh, a blue box, uh, ever enjoyed uh, phone hacking, ever enjoyed uh, being part of the hacker community, ever read the 2600 magazine, which is actually a derivative of all this, probably you want to look at the links down and go help uh, uh, John Draper, Captain Crunch, uh, to make it true in these late years of his uh, life. Okay, thank you very much again. Ciao. I guess my most memorial experience was what was your most memorable memorable experience? That was pretty much my most memorable. My, my most.
What was your most memorable experience? Memorable. Uh, memorial experience. What was your most memorable? Ah, oh, fuck me. <laughs> 